This note, which I am writing at the dawn of the 21st century in my Kurtzenisi residence, is meant for my contemporaries and for the generations to come. It is a warm autumn Tbilisi morning, amazingly quiet all around, and even the whispers of the leaves seem audible, compelling one to take a walk and listen to the universe, its epic and silent thoughts stemming from the depths of centuries and even spanning beyond. As for us, those passing through this world, all we can do is stand in awe before this transient moment and take in its greatness. I was born on January 25, 1928, in the village of Mamati in Guria, one of the most prominent Georgian regions. My father's name was Ambrosi. He taught Russian language and literature. As a parent, a pedagogue, and an educated person, my father was the greatest influence in my life. He was a teacher who would never raise his voice and who would never be tricked by his students. At first, he would throw a glance at those misbehaving without rebuking them. If improper conduct persisted, he would look again and finally say, I can see you. My mother Sopio was a daughter of Glakuna Pateishvili, a petty nobleman. Thanks to my mother, hard work was regarded as the supreme virtue in our family. She herself was a hard-working woman. Despite her poor health, she worked like a beaver. I can still remember the tender touch of her hands as I was falling asleep. She would not go to bed without having kissed me goodnight. My father and mother happened to be past their prime when I was born unexpectedly, which is why everyone doted on me. By the way, I went to school for the first time barefoot. I did not have any shoes, so I cried my heart out whining. Then my mother told me, you shouldn't be wearing shoes even if you had a pair. Your feet are nothing short of angelic. <laughs> Our family consisted of many different individuals. We were four brothers and one sister. We argued, but we stuck together when it came to our country, family, integrity, love, hard work, and loyalty, which saw us through some hard times. My childhood, my ancestral land, Guria and Gurians, my fellow villagers and my family are part of who I am today. And what makes me who I am and not somebody else is the people I watched, to whom I listened, and among whom I was raised. I was five when I harvested my first kilo of tea leaves. My father taught us how to tend bees, which is why looking at a honeycomb still makes me happy. It was there in my village and family that I grew accustomed to working on a farm, learning its hardship and benefits, and I am proud that I can be on equal terms with plowmen and shepherds, vineyard keepers and beekeepers, tea growers and builders. Frankly, I am proud that I can still do a thing or two with my own hands. Like all my peers at the age of 13 or 14, I dreamed of being on the front line during World War II. I tried to sneak out once, but I got caught, was given a good beating, and sent back home. Tragedy would not tarry long in visiting our home. My elder brother Akaki, who had been drafted before the war broke out, was soon killed defending the Brest fortress. Hippocrate, my other brother, was also drafted. 
and expected to go to the war any day. Like millions of my peers, the war put me through trial by fire, forging my faith and setting goals for me. The war against fascism turned into my personal cause and the fight against evil. Fascism had turned against communism, and communism was my religion. After having graduated with honors from the eighth grade in the Mamati school, I submitted to the wishes of my family and friends and enrolled in the Tbilisi Medical Vocational School. Everyone wanted me to become a medical doctor, and I too was into medicine at that time. I moved in with my sister in an old house on Pasanawuri Street in Tbilisi. I was not overly excited about living in an eight square meter basement-like room, but today I reminisce about those days with joy. By the time I was about to graduate from vocational school, I was seriously questioning my decision. When I was called in to the district committee of the all-union Leninist Young Communist League and offered a job as an instructor, I agreed without hesitation. This was something my parents never forgave me for. I joined the Communist Party in 1948. At first I worked as an instructor, and then I was put in charge of a department. This is how it worked back then. There was so much work to do that I had to work until 3 in the morning. Then I would retreat to our untidy and miserable room, a brief nap, and then the dawn of another day full of meetings, duties, and hopes. Eighteen months of hard work and dire material circumstances ultimately led me to tuberculosis. I spent several months in Bakhmaro, a highland health resort in Guria, which consisted of several pine log houses and a pathetic outpatient clinic. In 1951, I spent my vacation together with my sister in Sagveri, Borjomi Gorge. It was there, in that special romantic destination, that I first met Nanuli Tsagariashvili, my future wife. It was in the most gorgeous Borjomi Park that I proposed to her. People may meet by sheer accident. They become acquainted, then they share a special, invisible connection, chemistry. And ultimately, something called love takes over, compelling them to tie their lives to each other. I believe that love is a supreme form of feeling, purity, gentleness, and human closeness. Ten or fifteen days after we met for the first time, I already knew that it would work out between us, that it was not a passing acquaintanceship or an ordinary relationship. It so happened that I proposed to her and told her that I loved her. I said, we have to get married. He laughed. People wonder if love at first sight is real. Apparently, it is. We made quite a couple at that time. Anuli was gorgeous, and I was not ugly either. On the second or third day, she told me, You say you love me all right, but my background may hurt you on the path you have taken. She meant the Communist Party school and political life. So although it will take a heavy toll on me, I do not want to be a burden on your shoulders. He paused, he even turned pale, you know. I could see that clearly. He stood there in silence for a couple of minutes and then said, well, what can I do? I'd rather ditch my career than give up my love. We never registered our marriage, though both she and I wanted to. We just were too lazy to go to the registry. We obtained a marriage certificate as late as 30 years after. <laughs> Who could afford a wedding reception? We certainly couldn't. There were only my sister, Anuli's brother, and a few others. We just sat at a table with a couple of bottles of wine that we got hold of somehow. And that was our wedding reception, our version of a lavish, festive celebration. 
Until Edward became a prospective member of the political bureau, we were quite needy. Nobody believes that. Once I had surgery on my back and my stay in the hospital coincided with my birthday. Manana said, Daddy, mommy does not have a wedding ring, and I would know where she keeps her money. So they used my money to buy me a wedding ring and brought it to me. Of course, I was overjoyed. I believe that family is the foundation of mankind, and to me, it is like oxygen. Without my family, I am a man without oxygen. Inawuri has awarded your mother with a certificate in honor of watchfulness. <laughs> Our life has been a true romance novel, full of joy, happiness, and tragedies. I would not call our meeting and marriage accidental. There was some chemistry between our characters, our human relations. When we met for the first time, one would hardly imagine another person who had been through so much. After her father was arrested and executed, her whole family was left homeless. Later, however, we saw good times. Our talents and skills saw us along our path, which has been no bed of roses, with its difficulties and obstacles, which we have trodden in love for each other, always being there for each other. I do not have time for family. Truly, I was too busy. When I would leave or come back home, the children would be either still or already asleep. So I had no chance to teach them, to instruct or guide them, though they hardly needed it. Our life followed its own course. I had to adapt to the course that I faced in real life. Wherever I worked, I encountered the same major problems, which was personal and professional independence. That was my primary concern. Although I was the first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Georgia, and then even a prospective member of the political bureau of the Central Committee, very often I could not solve simple issues unless I bowed down before central authorities. Without consulting Moscow and receiving its approval, we could not take the slightest step Achieving real sovereignty for the Georgian Republic was a problem I constantly faced. One time, I said concerning the Georgiev's treaty, Georgia's sun rises in the north, which my fellow compatriots would not forgive for a long time, though these words serve my country's interests. I said it for Russia to hear so that more could be done for Georgia. We lived in an era where I had to maneuver constantly to save the Georgian nation and preserve Georgian culture. By taking certain political steps, sometimes giving up something secondary, sometimes at the expense of dignity, I still succeeded in maintaining as much of a level of independence as was possibly imaginable in the Soviet Union. By that time, Georgia had already turned into an oasis of liberalism across the Union. Everything that would never see the light of day in Moscow was published here. It was then that it became possible to save the David Kareji Monastery complex and to establish the Department for Monument Protection to save churches, monasteries, and cultural monuments. I was a young, uncompromising idealist, and I had many supporters, young people who gathered around me, agile people full of hope, writers, film and theater directors, artists, scientists, representatives of different social strata who sought to make a difference in life. Authors Nodar Dumbadze, Jansug Chakviani, Guram Panjikidze, and Rezo Amashukeli were the first to stand by me, and many others supported me, advised me, and assisted me. Long live young Georgians, young men and women. Georgia's youth are beauty, hope, and future. This change in the course of action caught many by surprise. They realized that I had a different prudent stance on problematic issues. 
In 1972, I was elected first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Georgia. We had to overcome our past and reevaluate historical values. I started seeking solutions, at least economic solutions, even within one district to start. We succeeded in granting farmers long-term land use rights. There were many experiments underway in Georgia, such as the Abasha or Poti experiment. Then artistic freedom was ushered in, meaning that the writers, theater actors and others were free in their work, and that was something unforgivable. This is how it worked, and I think it was the attitude of Brezhnev himself. First, I really praised him. You can listen to my speeches at Central Committee plenary sessions and conventions. I prize this award tenfold since I received it personally from Leonid Brezhnev, a great successor to the cause of the immortal Lenin and a person loved and cherished by all honest people. Of course, I started by lauding Brezhnev as a kind man who helps and supports us. But if you read the second part, you will be shocked how I had the nerve to say what I was saying. In fact, it read that we were in decay and we had to seek solutions. We had to grant greater freedom to the republics so that they might do what had to be done. I would like to cite an example how a fierce and large-scale conflict was resolved timely, prudently, and decisively, meaning a problem of national importance related to keeping the status of the Georgian language, which was resolved peacefully on April 14, 1978. The main goal of the 1978 Constitution was to form a unified, common Soviet state with one language, one mentality, which was a path leading to the loss of national identity, leading to Russification. I was a member of the All-Union Constitutional Commission and even chaired the Republican Commission. Naturally, it tore at my heart when I read what the bill had to say about language. I managed to meet with Brezhnev and explain everything. I described to him what the native tongue meant for Georgians, stressing that even under Lenin, the Georgian language maintained the status of state language in our republic the Soviet leadership was unwavering in its decision. On the morning of April 14th, I was already aware of spontaneous gatherings. I also knew that young people would take to the streets that day. That night, tanks were stationed in the streets of Tbilisi. I would be held responsible for the consequences, bloodless or bloody, notwithstanding the fact that no one would ask my opinion if it came to shooting. I was delivering a report Notes kept coming in to the presidium of the Supreme Soviet, some from Inauri and others from Kolbin, who was the second secretary of the Central Committee at that time. Reportedly, young demonstrators started off from the State University. We received the second note informing us that they had arrived at the Polytechnic Institute. Then another note, they were rallying by the Opera House. Every time we received a note, Inauri stepped out, which made everyone nervous. When Inauri, the senior officer of the Georgian KGB, steps out, it can only mean one thing. Something is up. Something is wrong. By the way, we could even hear the noise coming from the street. There were many people. I'm not sure how many exactly. Must have been 20 to 30,000, give or take a few. For the most part, those were young people. Some might have followed the crowd, but most were committed to saving their language. Then I made a statement. We must keep the provision institutionalizing Georgian as the state language. No words can describe what was happening in that hall. All those communists, secretaries of district committees, and ministers started hugging and kissing one another. And I, to be honest, choked up, seeing how much the party elite could take those things to heart and realizing that patriotism was alive and kicking. That time in Tbilisi, we won a very important victory against the empire, and it was not limited only to Georgia. I am proud to have been a participant, and to some extent, even a leader of those events from the very start. Consequently, going to Moscow was not an easy task at all. At best, my case would be reviewed at a meeting of the political bureau. 
Brezhnev, however, refused to review the case. He did not want to irritate people any further. <laughs> as long as there is no mutiny in Georgia, let him do whatever he pleases. I think that must have been the attitude at that time. Otherwise, I would never be forgiven the events of April 1978. I spent almost seven years as Minister of Interior, and Inauri was in charge of state security at that time. I asked, and he authorized me to search through the archives, and I came across things that I cannot reveal to you, or include in my memoirs, or anything of that kind, that I may write one day. There was so much dirt and informant reporting, so many lies, and consequently half of the writers had been annihilated, and a multitude of scientists arrested. I have disciplined myself not to commit the sin, lest innocent people fall into the snare, and that has been my rule. Speaking of which, I am proud that almost no wrongful arrests as such took place while I was in charge. I set my greatest hopes on support from the people. They supported me in my undertakings. I had so many big shots nabbed. Back then they were called shadow entrepreneurs, who were largely considered untouchable and immune to accountability. By the way, I established the first institute of public opinion and asked Nico Muskelishvili and university professors to take part in it. The Javanadze and members of the political bureau were present there. They were all curious about that innovation of mine, the Institute of Public Opinion. Sergo Zakhariadze rose to his feet and said, I am not asking your permission to take the floor. All I want is to address Edward. Edward, do not let them discourage you. Finish what you have started. <laughs> We believed in Stalin. Then we came to believe in Khrushchev. I used to write letters of praise to him too, like Dear Nikita Sergeyevich, lauding the glorious decades. Then I learned that he was the one to have dispatched tanks and armored fighting vehicles to the streets of Tbilisi, which claimed the lives of 150 young men and women. Then there was Brezhnev and everyone else. One of the main duties of a politician is the timely prevention and resolution of conflicts. Maybe this is why I recall the ones I failed to solve. I remember them not only because of my personal failure, but also because of the pain that they caused the country, society, and particular persons. One such conflict was related to the case of the so-called aircraft boys. At some point in its resolution, the situation fell outside my remit and fell under Moscow's total control. Their departure was planned like a movie, and unfortunately, it ultimately developed like the most heart-wrenching film, claiming human lives, including some of the hijackers. The Soviet court, as well as the international judiciary, was quite tough in such cases, severely punishing aircraft hijackers, organizers, and killers of passengers. <laughs> You know, it is most heartbreaking and difficult for me to go back when I received a call informing me that an airplane had been hijacked. Together with the chairperson of the security committee and other colleagues, I rushed to the airport. I tried to get closer to the airplane and ascend the air stair, but the gates were closed, so I was denied entry. Although many pleaded with me to avert the death penalty for the surviving hijackers, I was powerless. There was nothing I, as a public official or an ordinary citizen, could do about it. It had been my failure and everlasting pain. As a leader of Soviet Georgia, I had to tackle a difficult problem pertaining to that time, the repatriation of the Jews to Israel. The Soviet leadership made an all-out effort to prevent the Jews from returning to their historical homeland. Back then, I assisted 17 Jews in returning home, and I am proud of it. My narrative about my work in communist Georgia would be incomplete without remembering one particular story. I am talking about the production 
of Tengiz Abuladze's movie, Repentance. Tengi Sabaladze approached me and said, please read it. I know it will never be produced, let alone screened, but please, at least read it. I was so impressed when I pictured how the film would look on the screen that, as I returned the script to Mr. Abaladze, I told him, of course, do not hold your hopes high about it ever being screened, but it still has to be produced, by all means. Otherwise, it will equal a crime against future generations. It was in Georgia precisely that the evaluation of the Soviet authoritarian regime through cinematography and taking the first step to repentance were made possible. I also took part in taking this step, and I too repented before God and the nation by supporting the production of this movie, to say the least. The film perfectly illustrated processes in the Soviet Union, which is why it is so important ideologically. Repentance ends with a conceptual phrase. At first glance, it sounds like direct instruction, but in atheistic society, this question had to be poised squarely and unabashedly, so that godless people could reflect not only on the path that had led them to a dead end, but also on the God Most High, whom they had denied in the first place. I would not say that it was because of this movie or phrase that I came to ponder the reason why we are here on Earth and where we are headed. What defines our actions and who besides men is out there to pass judgment on our lives? This was an unconscious search for paths leading to God and the first steps taken toward God. Continuous meetings and conversations with Gorbachev turned into interactions between like-minded people. We no longer held back our views from each other. We got along well and had no secrets from Gorbachev, and vice versa. He revealed to me what he liked or disliked, and he disliked many things. He usually vacationed in Beach Vinta each winter, and I would visit him for a few days. We would engage in conversation as we walked through the trees, knowing that the chances of surveillance were quite low. Our conversations ended with these words, everything is rotten to the core, it must be changed altogether. The signed agreement confirms that the new way of thinking adopted by the government in the state does work. One time Gorbachev phoned me saying, we had a discussion here and I think you should be Minister of Foreign Affairs. Comrades, I have been delegated by the Central Committee of the Communist Party to nominate Deputy Edward Shevardnadze to the Office of Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Soviet Union. It felt like a bucket of ice-cold water was poured on me on a hot day. The Soviet Minister of Foreign Affairs, and I would be like apples and oranges. I had no diplomatic experience, none whatsoever. I was hoping they would designate someone to guide me and lead the way. I had a vague idea where the building of the foreign ministry was. I had caught a glimpse of it, but that was it. I knew nothing about it, and I had no clue how to get there. All right, I reasoned. They will probably send someone to accompany me. Everyone knows you there. Your future deputies, who are already aware of your appointment, will meet you there. What was I supposed to do? I took a seat in the car that delivered me to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I shook hands with everyone. Some knew who I was. And then I said, I don't even know what to tell you. 
This is our first meeting. You know well that I have no experience and I am no diplomat. You, on the other hand, are all diplomats with decades of experience. What makes my situation even more difficult is that Andrei Gromyko, who led the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for 30 years, is a globally acclaimed man, a true ship, while I am just an ordinary boat. They gave me a perplexed look, and then I added, a boat powered by a motor, however. <laughs> they burst out laughing, and then my trouble started. There were Schultz, Genscher, and others, true giants all over me. There were Nanuli and the wives of other senior officials. In a nutshell, I was introduced in my new capacity. And to add insult to injury, they, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, had scheduled talks with Schultz on disarmament issues for that same day. I knew nothing about those long-range SS-20 missiles. I could not tell short-range missiles from intermediate. I had never seen or dealt with them. In November 1985, I participated in the 40th UN General Assembly in New York. The Soviet Union offers a world with drastically decreasing and ultimately abolished nuclear weapons. At last, the Soviet Union and the U.S. have spoken together without using nuclear terminology. I met with foreign ministers from different countries. The most important meeting was held with U.S. President Ronald Reagan. He hosted breakfast in my honor. The foundation for rapport and normal human relations between Reagan and me was laid at that meeting. Then there were active informal relations, visits with families, acquaintances, and making friends. These informal relations played the decisive role. I was a regular guest of foreign ministers and presidents, not to mention George Bush Sr., with whom we were like close friends. The first three years were dedicated to confidence building, to finding ways to end the Cold War. Uh, I think it's going rather well. You were aware of the main message. Today we launched preparations for this meeting. We, particularly the Soviet Union, are responsible for starting the Cold War. A new vision had to be formulated in relation to the West. The West, which had been viewed as a class enemy and cooperation with which had been possible only within limited boundaries. Without exaggeration, I had the final say in the withdrawal of Soviet troops from Afghanistan. I am saying this without false modesty, and I am proud of this. I have already pointed out that we have been traditionally cooperating with Iraq, including far-reaching military partnership, which is no secret. I was convinced that the country's official democratization would ultimately bring independence to the republics, including Georgia, and that was my non-uttered dream. We have a very good relationship. We have been able to achieve very much over the last few years. I never rushed into action, and while some believed otherwise, my actions were always calculated scrupulously and considered with precision. In 1988 to 1989, U.S.-USSR relations reached new heights. The era of animosity between the two countries was over. By that time, I already knew that Gorbachev's attitude toward me had changed. Seemingly, he was cooling off and distancing himself from me, as though he were troubled by my growing reputation and influence. In 1988, I visited 16 countries, meeting with the heads of leading countries across the globe, the foreign ministers of 25 states, and almost 40 ambassadors. Those were no ordinary meetings. In each case, I had to pick the right words and say what was expected of me so that I could benefit my country and turn enemies into friends. I remember my visit to Iran 
where I met with Ayatollah Khomeini. He was ill, unable to accept visitors at the insistence of his doctors. He agreed to meet with me as an exception, and the visit proved truly historic. After my return to Georgia, Ras Fanjani came to Tbilisi to tell me, you were the only foreigner to meet with Khomeini. Strangely enough, that meeting laid the foundation for new relations between Georgia and Iran, at least on a personal level. By 1989, unique relations had developed between Baker and myself. Besides a formal partnership, we also maintained our friendship. Once at the Department of State, Baker told me, let me take you to a most beautiful place where I built a villa. I know your country is gorgeous, but this place stands out of all America, and I would love to show it to you. It took us four or five hours to fly to Wyoming. On the following day, we negotiated outdoors. The weather was great. We were in the middle of a nature reserve near a lake. The landscapes reminded me of the Elizani Valley as seen from Signahi up above. Both Baker and I were in high spirits. For the first time in history, our two countries agreed that we were no longer enemies. Moreover, we were friends who assumed the responsibility of cooperating globally. This unprecedented level of relations offered the whole world greater prospects. After the negotiations, we went fishing. Baker gave me fishing boots that I keep to this day. He caught one tiny fish, and I came away empty-handed, but still the political catch was significant. Especially vivid are my recollections of the first official visit to Great Britain and the meeting with Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Contrary to protocol, she greeted me on the porch stairs of her residence. Technically, I was supposed to be welcomed inside the building. Our negotiations went beyond the England-USSR relations to analyze different in-depth aspects of the relations between the East and the West. The farewell ceremony was along the same lines as the greeting. Thatcher accompanied me downstairs and held a press conference outdoors. The weather, similar to the political climate, was fabulous. Besides changing the political climate, we signed three agreements, which meant a lot, given the many years of outright cold relations in the past. I immediately labeled the conversations with Thatcher as the Great Talks. We don't have differences of view. But you're criticizing the British... We have just made a statement in all this respect. <laughs> as luck would have it, Germany and the German people have always stood by myself and my people. Germany and its reunification proved to be one of the most important missions of my life, enabling me to make both a name across the world and many friends. Hans-Dietrich Genscher, for one, while one Georgian, namely Stalin, played the decisive role in the defeat of Germany, I tried to promote its unification. I was privileged to take part in the struggle, seeking to end the Cold War. It was a lucky turn of fate, not my personal merit. Had we failed to compromise and make concessions, and I reiterate that many shy away from using this phrase, a third world war would have been inevitable, and this fire would be first kindled in the heart of Europe. In relation to the German issue, Gorbachev attended only one forum, the concluding session of the G6 summit. I was crucified for the same thing that brought Gorbachev a Nobel Prize. Without solving the problems of Germany's neighbors, the Polish issue being the priority in this regard, peace would be impossible in Europe. There were people who hated giving up Poland and even considered dispatching troops there. I did my best to ensure against it. I even visited Pope John Paul II in the Vatican. He could avert a civil war with just one word. Indeed, Pope John Paul traveled to Poland and eliminated the threat of civil war. I knew him very well. I met him three times while serving as the Minister of Foreign Affairs. After returning to Georgia, I really wanted the Pope of Rome to visit my country, and I, with the support of Catholicos Patriarch Ilya II, succeeded to this end in 1999. 
I do not know when a Georgian man will have another chance to meet with leaders from almost every continent and to introduce his country to them. In my case, although I represented a non-Georgian empire, still a Georgian man participated in regulating relations with the leading states of almost every continent. After my visits to Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, Cuba, Nicaragua, and many others, formal diplomatic relations were transformed into lively interactions. I was in Africa too, where I had a special meeting with Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. For better or worse, first as a Soviet foreign minister and then as the president of Georgia, I succeeded. And it was the Georgian character, Georgian gregariousness, Georgian sense of humor, and Georgian wit that helped me find a way out of many difficult situations. It is not for me to judge how good a foreign minister I was. The more successful I was in the international arena, however, the stronger my opposition grew at home. You will become Minister of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you for the warm meeting. The conservative wing was already aware of the danger it faced. They would not dare oppose the Secretary General, so they unleashed all the criticism on me. Sometimes Arxnis and the likes of him would insult me in Parliament so unfairly that I did not even know how to reply. A storm was brewing. Something was about to happen. Finally, I realized that it would prove hard to protect me, and Gorbachev seemed to have quit protecting me. He did not protect me because there were many. There were 6,000 people employed at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, half of whom were KGB agents. On the other hand, there were honest people who would come to me to keep me updated on the real state of affairs, so I knew for sure that a coup d'etat was around the corner. In 1990, before I resigned the office of Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Soviet Union, a number of bloody events took place which confirmed my and other people's suspicions that along with democratic processes, a conspiracy was underway involving violent means aiming to maintain the Soviet system. The tragedy in Tbilisi tore my heart out and made its bloody mark on my soul. On April 9, 1989, the Georgian nation was given an exemplary punishment. Although I was physically in Moscow at that time, I too was punished in Tbilisi. We were having a conversation at the airport, and I kept watching him, his facial expressions, to see if he would be surprised or something. He took the news as though he had known or sensed something. But I did not want to bear false witness against him by insisting that he surely knew what was happening. What should we do? People were already gathering, demonstrators, commotion, and all that. And Gorbachev turned to me. Maybe you should fly to Georgia. There's a plane. I replied that I did not mind, but first I had to make a phone call to make sure that my presence would not make things worse. I called Jumbur Patiashvili and told him about it. I asked, what do you think? He replied that it would not be necessary. My arrival could compel more people to take to the streets. He said, we will make sure everything is all right tomorrow morning. Then I called Gorbachev and delivered Patiashvili's message. All right, think about it tomorrow. You know what happened that night, and it did not have to happen. The country's authorities resorted to a tried method, that is, brutal force, and that was the beginning of the end. The subsequent collapse of the Soviet Union was inevitable. I keep thinking, and I still cannot come to a definite conclusion. We, Gorbachev and I, were abroad. The Secretary General should have been aware of it. 
But he kept assuring me otherwise, swearing on our friendship. One thing would not stop bugging me, though. I did not want people to suspect me of knowing what was about to happen on April 9th, as if I was abroad, aware of everything, and therefore with a guilty conscience. I was not aware of anything. It all happened unbeknownst to me, with no blood on my hands. Perestroika was stabbed in the back in Tbilisi on April 9, 1989. The situation in the country was unstable, and the authorities at a loss, which was largely triggered by a conflict between Gorbachev and Yeltsin. The situation was alarming. I even told Gorbachev about it. He seemed to listen, but the alienation between Gorbachev and me became obvious. Probably when the international reputation of the Soviet foreign minister reached its apex imparting to him a certain degree of independence in his actions. I became a nuisance to Gorbachev. The relations with global leaders acquired new dimensions which irritated many. While at first Gorbachev and I were in charge of Perestroika, sharing its ups and downs, now I was on my own. Therefore my resignation had its reasons, personal and official, ethical, and those stemming from future considerations their victory would surely pose a personal threat to me. It was even planned to hand my apartment to somebody else. I was a target. I knew it, and they did not even try to hold it back. I will be straightforward, comrade Democrats, meaning a broader sense of these words. We have broken up. The reformers have scattered from here to breakfast. And I am stating with all assuredness that a dictatorship is at hand. I reason that either extreme caution had to be exercised or someone had to fall victim to this ordeal so that people could come to their senses. I announce my resignation. Please do not react or judge me. Let it be my contribution, if you will my token protest against dictatorship. Dictatorship will fail. The future belongs to democracy and freedom. Thank you so much. I was 62 then, great age for a government official, when you know exactly what to do and how. I also sensed the danger facing my family, but I had to have my say. Even as a political recluse, I was never alone. My apartment in Moscow frequently hosted people whom I could call friends. My wife and I welcomed them with open arms. Besides being a breath of fresh air in our lives, they also cheered us and made sure we knew that they still, just like before, appreciated a friendly partner in me. Thanks to meetings with Jim Baker, Hans Dietrich Genscher, Roland Duma, and Jeffrey Howe, I felt on top of big time politics. In August 1991, tanks appeared in the streets of Moscow, headed towards the Russian White House. We entered the White House courtyard. In times like those, people are especially sensitive to whoever stands by them. Someone noticed me and exclaimed, Shevardnadze is with us. Gorbachev was dealt with what was largely perceived as a death blow. History never forgives those who are late. Ensuring a relatively painless, controllable transition was imperative. Due to both subjective and objective reasons, peaceful dissolution of the Soviet Union proved possible only in part, which had grievous implications for my country. It is a weird historical coincidence that the Soviet Union, Stalin's creation, was dissolved on his birthday, December 21, 1991. The last empire of the 20th century collapsed, the bloody and utopian Soviet Union, which was established contrary to the will of God and laws of nature. I more frequently considered returning to Georgia. When I was asked how I saw it, I answered, I will return when the time is right, and nothing will be able to stop me. I knew that that would surely happen. The time was ripe to make a decision about going back mostly due to the strong influence of public opinion in Georgia. 
I understood better than anyone that the risk was way too high. Much was at stake at that time, including my life. Then why am I making this choice? I kept asking myself and replied, I am going back because I cannot do otherwise. And that was a patriot in me answering, not a politician. I already knew that the situation in Georgia was dire, practically a civil war. But I, a man born and raised in Georgia, who had received from his country everything he could receive, that I became a diplomat and minister of foreign affairs was the merit of my Georgian experience. In addition, the pressure was so intense, meaning incoming calls and the like, that I had no choice but to return, though I had no clue what I would do thereafter. Some suggested my candidacy for foreign ministership or some other positions. Those were the attitudes at the time, though life had something different up its sleeve. On March 7, 1992, I flew from Moscow to Tbilisi. It was my wife Nanuli's birthday, and I, as usual, wished her many years that morning. It is your birthday too, she replied. It is the dawn of a new day for you. Truly, I had a different life in a different time, in a different country, and I, too, was different. If we stick together, all of us, we will be able to save our country and heal our wounds. One hour later, I entered the Sioni Cathedral, not as a politician, but as a man who first seeks a spiritual foundation in Georgia. And I was granted this foundation at a meeting with Catholicos Patriarch Ilya II. Shemdek. He visited us here in the patriarchal residence. We blessed him and welcomed him back home. He was already a believer. The hard times he had experienced led him to the Lord. He decided to be baptized. It was a crucial decision in his life. Some took it as a political step, but it was not. He became a true Orthodox Christian, a member of the Georgian Orthodox Church. Though later in life I did come to believe, I used to be an unbeliever because of my upbringing. The state and ideology of that time were irreconcilable with the views about God. Deep in my heart, I believed in something. For instance, when passing exams or going through special events in my life, Sometimes, as a child, an adolescent, or even later, I would make the sign of the cross in secret. That conversation and subsequent meetings with the Catholicos Patriarch gave me peace and brought a joyous light into my soul. Ilya II became my godfather, and George was a Christian name given to me. I would not say I became extremely religious, but my soul longs for God. I believe and it fills me with peace and faith. Amen. Every person is given a cross that he must bear all his life. There are people whom the Lord chooses to bear the cross for a whole nation. Of course, it is a very difficult and responsible cross to bear, both before God and before the people. I arrived in Georgia when the process of deterioration in the country was in an advanced stage. Downtown Tbilisi lay in ruins, and the whole city had turned into a playground for street gangs. The Poti port and railroad were blocked. 
Cargoes transported towards Abkhazia were robbed repeatedly, and losses amounted to 11 billion rubles. I arrived here 10 days ago, and frankly, I cannot hold back my emotions. And I am at a loss for words, unable to describe the pain we are experiencing today. You cannot believe in two gods. There is only one God to believe in. We believe in one God and in Georgia, our homeland. Those who confess this God must join our citizens on a path to Georgia's freedom and democracy. Physically, I never felt lonely. I was swamped with meetings at the Kertsanisi residence. Of course, when it came to meetings, I had the final say, but I could not deny anyone. It may sound pretentious, but they all spoke on behalf of Georgia. They were the leaders of parties and movements adhering to different views and beliefs, including Zviad Gamsakhurdia's supporters and my opponents, writers, artists, movie and theater directors, scientists, Georgian, Russian, and Western reporters, and refugees from the Georgian Ossetian conflict zone. They kept coming and bringing their problems, concerns, suggestions, and ideas, which amassed to one continuous confession, with Georgia as a slate motif. I have to admit that I was quite perplexed. These people asked for my help and protection but they did not know how much I needed their support and assistance. There were meetings that warmed the cockles of my heart. On the other hand, some of those whom I had considered loyal and reliable friends cold-shouldered me, while others rubbed salt in the wound by making me listen to their unfair, premeditated accusations. Let's not cause divisions in our society saying that these are Shevardnadze's supporters and those of somebody else. I don't want to mention any names. You know well whom I mean. Georgia cannot be divided. It simply cannot. Georgia's Georgian society, the Georgian nation, and every Georgian citizen must stick together. And this is the only root of our immortality. And this is exactly how we will build a Georgia that will endure forever. After my return, I felt like I had been to hell, but never back. We will try to compensate you to the fullest possible extent. Stop yelling. I am trying to speak with you like a human being. A government commission has been established. Every case will be investigated. My anxiety was often relieved by pondering an unexpectedly remedial thought. You have returned to your homeland not to claim glory, honor, and prosperity, but to do what you are called to do. Patience is a quality one must have in life. It is mandatory for politicians and heads of state. Sometimes you have to wipe off the dirt thrown on your face and keep your cool. It does not mean, however, that you should not reply. It's just that you reply when you are strong enough and when people take your words at face value. It is not about being educated or uneducated. People pass by and say, Judas! Why am I a Judas? Why? What have I done? This man has done for his homeland and people just as much as you have. What is wrong with us? How could we let ourselves degenerate to the point of calling a man a Judas? Why am I a Judas? I had no formal position, no authority, or grounds for legal action. I came here with one folder in my hands, back when one member of the military council ran the paramilitary Mehed Rioni. Another had the National Guard under his command, and the third was in charge of the state administration. We were in urgent need of an election, otherwise we would never break through international isolation. 
to ensure the recognition of Georgia's independence. After returning to my devastated homeland, I set two goals, to lay the foundation for a market economy and to usher in a true democracy. Like all the post-Soviet environment, Western democracy was a novelty in Georgia. There was no experience in this regard. We had to learn how to live under actual independence and democracy, which required a legitimate government, democratic elections, and respect for freedom of speech, the formation of independent media, and the promotion of its development. Humanitarian aid from Germany, the US, and Turkey started to enter Georgia. My appeal from this side of the wall, which was published by dozens of international publications, received much feedback in many countries around the world. We were not alone. I received an invitation to participate in the Conference for the Health of Black Sea States in Istanbul, attended by senior officials. This series of visits, which along with Georgia entering the international arena, reflected the solidarity and political and economic support we received in a matter of weeks, allowed me to consolidate my strength. They never offered me any wine, so let's at least have some water. It's great, but nowhere near Fanchkara. In fact, Georgia, a country plagued by economic, political, and spiritual crises, dedicated all its time and effort after my return to fighting on multiple fronts, to overcoming terrorism at home, and staving off external pressure to regulate the conflict in Skenvali and break through the circle of international isolation. Abkhazia was added to the two main areas of tension, South Ossetia and Samagrelo. Actually, dangerous tensions had been brewing in Abkhazia even earlier, but this time the Abkhazian authorities turned unmistakably separatist. These processes were orchestrated from outside Georgia. On top of it all, a good friend of mine, the Russian vice president, called me with threats. I will have a squadron bombed Tbilisi. And that was not all. According to our intelligence, a rally of armed supporters of the former president was planned for May 26th. The top event to celebrate in said week of diplomatic breakthrough was the visit of U.S. Secretary of State James Baker on the eve of Georgia's Independence Day. It's a great pleasure to arrive in an independent and democratic Georgia. And with me, I carry the best wishes and the strong support of President Bush. No one could appreciate the full political and purely interpersonal importance of this gesture better than I did. I truly prized his presence in Tbilisi at such a moment. Once back in America, Jim did everything in his power to supply us with the initial aid, 100 tons of wheat allocated by President Bush. The aid arrived in the nick of time. On June 24th, as I was about to fly to Sochi to meet and work with the Russian president on an agreement seeking ways to regulate the Georgian Ossetian conflict, an armed group of the former president's supporters took over the internal troops' armory and then the TV and radio department, urging people to unite under his banner. After having quickly suppressed this coup attempt, I flew to Sochi where I held talks with Yeltsin and signed an agreement on dispatching tripartite peacemaking forces to the Georgian Ossetian conflict zone. I felt relieved, though I was still somewhat anxious. Although shooting stopped, the commission failed to prevent militants from entering the region. On July 23, 1992, the parliament of the Abkhazian autonomy under Artzimba annulled the 1978 constitution, which practically meant Abkhazia's succession from Georgia. Preparations for all that had been long underway since the Soviet era. Khrushchev once told Javanadze, you better behave or I will unleash the Abkhazians on you. Khrushchev was aware of such plans being developed backstage. With money and weapons already in place, all they needed was an excuse to start a war, to instigate a confrontation. The State Council continued its work nonetheless. In my first 100 days in power, as I sometimes encountered political ignobility, 
hypocrisy and deceit, I felt an urge to end it once and for all. Of course, I could have gone where I was invited and lived the peaceful life of a retired politician. I could have made a living giving lectures and writing memoirs, yet it would be existence and nothing else. I would have left behind a civil war in full swing, starvation, unemployment, a recession, endless queues for bread and gas, with people eager to kill one another, everything would sink into bloody chaos. Continuous explosions kept plaguing Western Georgia. Millions of rubles worth of state-owned goods, such as thousands of tons of humanitarian aid from abroad, was stolen from railroad stations. I know that there are evil people out there who are capable of all kinds of crimes. But until now, I thought that even evil had its limits. Apparently, I was mistaken. We decided to produce a plan tonight for military operations. First, Mr. Tengiz Kitovani, the Minister of Defense, is now in charge of the protection of railroads, highways, and bridges, the most laborious and crucial task in all of Georgia, from Lesaliza to the Kazbegi district, so that the borders may be redrawn and order restored. I told Lord Zinba that I had ordered one military unit stationed in the suburbs of Sohumi, another in Lesaliza, and the third in Samtredia, and even those were security teams to accompany trains. We came to an agreement, and that was my biggest mistake. I should have flown to the spot, but the situation in Tbilisi was extremely difficult, and I could not leave the capital. A day later, Georgian police officers and Abkhazians clashed. I cannot find out who dispatched the Georgian police forces. It was quite characteristic of that time, with no discipline and prevailing disobedience, with everyone doing what he pleased. The Abkhazian Council assessed all that as the attempt of misappropriation of Abkhazian territories and called for blanket mobilization. I arrived in Suhumi, but I never met with Ardzinba. He was avoiding me. Yeltsin called me from Moscow, offering to hold a meeting to put an end to the war. At a meeting in Moscow, we announced that the war was over, as attested by the agreement signed by Ardzinba, Yeltsin, and myself and by the handshakes publicly exchanged between us. We will ensure that our agreement will not just look good on paper. We will fight to establish peace in this difficult region. Georgia was celebrating. Unfortunately, however, that very day, September 3rd, marked the beginning of Georgia's defeat. How could we start a war against Abkhazia, knowing what power stood behind it? It must have been as clear as day. Who in his right mind starts a war in a totally isolated country, no industry, agriculture, with banks robbed blind? I missed it. I have no idea where it is. It's hiding. That tank is behind the concrete wall on the road. should adjust it to our eyesight. We're about the same age, so... <laughs> what is targeting now? There must have been a car down the road. That's what it's been targeting for an hour now. September 3rd, 1992, marked the beginning of events that proved a fateful day for Georgia. We trusted them, but they betrayed our trust. One lesson I learned from fair play in international relations was that, once signed, especially by the head of a state, an agreement must be implemented. You should tape it. It was painted in Tbilisi at the order of Grachev. We soon learned that good words and bad deeds were two totally different things double politics persisted. The enemy had a tremendous advantage, and despite the selfless resistance of the Georgians, Gagrafel, where all Georgians, young and old, were slaughtered. 
In light of yesterday's treachery and backstabbing, I have reached a dead end. I see no way out. When the issue of leaving Gagra became urgent, I flew to Gatiadi. We had between 800 and 900 soldiers under Gia Karkarashvili's command. And we took measures somehow to keep that key settlement. I stayed there until evening. We had to obtain permission from the Russians to fly. Although they turned down our request, I still flew. Before leaving, we took necessary steps. As we were flying back in the evening, another chopper positioned itself under us and then went down. I did not see that, I was told later. There was an artificial hole created by the chopper that had dropped. All that would have been left to do to destroy our craft was sink it in the water. However, the seasoned pilot operating the craft next to us, I believe his last name was Mai Suradze, noticed the trap and radioed us to accelerate upward to avoid crashing. Our pilot pushed the chopper upward so rapidly that those accompanying me, including my bodyguards, reporters and others, all wound up rolling on the floor. Was it under us? Right under you. It was positioned so well that our group seemed to be being escorted with three units. I was some 500 meters from it, otherwise I would never have noticed. You think it was a professional pilot? Yes, exceptionally professional. Something kept telling me to stand firm and stay put. Easy to say, right? Young men, much younger than I, all dropped to the floor, rolling. Yet I just stood there on my own two feet. I didn't move a bit, as though nothing had happened. It was decided to take down our craft, a full-fledged terrorist attack. It must have been the will of the Almighty, you know. Only the Almighty can inspire you to keep your calm, to restrain your emotions, lest you and those around you perish. It's been a very traumatic experience. I cannot say anything at this point. Things are out of my control. It's the first time that I have faced something like this. Finally, for a hundredth time, we trusted Russia's peacemaking mission as a guarantor and mediator and signed the July 27, 1993 agreement. In return, we were once again stabbed in the back. Alas, people came to trust this agreement. Refugees flocked back to Abkhazia, followed by a nationwide tragedy. We should not have let the refugees return to the city that was still in disarray and agitated. There was no stopping them, though. Russia proceeded to carpet bomb Sohumi. I tried to get in touch with Yeltsin, yet to no avail. In reply, I was told that he was busy. I will never believe that he was too busy to address Georgian-Russian relations. Georgia is small compared to Russia, yet these dimensions are negligible in the political equation of forces. Russia must be informed about what is going on, about how Georgia is being treated. It is aggression and occupation. Dear friends, citizens of Abkhazia, Georgia, Georgia is facing hard times, especially in the city of Sohumi. Insurgents and Abkhaz separatists and militants are swarming into our cherished city. Let me tell you, however, that Georgia, the Georgian army, and Sohumi residents are defending Sohumi. I am astonished by your heroism, your courage, your selflessness. I am convinced that Sohumi will never be abandoned, will never fall, because the loss of Sohumi will herald Georgia's division and fall 
and the Georgian people will never let that happen. Yesterday proved extremely tough, and today will be even worse, because we have lost many positions. As you already mentioned, the enemy is practically in the city already, holding strategically important positions. We are outnumbered, so if we survive tomorrow morning, the situation may improve toward the end of the day. Until the last moment, I believe that we should keep Sohumi. I remember chairing a general staff meeting at two in the morning. There were five vigorous battalions stationed by the river. However, the first thing I asked was whether the funicular was still protected. The commander of the battalion in charge of protecting the funicular was present also at the meeting. He replied, you take care of the rest. The funicular is well protected. No one can come near it. I had no choice but to believe him. I got up early in the morning to find half of Sohumi abandoned, women fleeing with their children and suitcases. I rushed to the government office. Zhiuli Shartava was in charge back then. What is going on? I asked. The battalions had been discharged at the former president's orders. I got into a car and rode to where the battalions were supposed to be stationed. I found no one. The barracks had been vacated. I returned to the headquarters to find Gia Karkarashvili, Jaba Iosiliani, and several other men. Jaba and I directly addressed the fleeing battalions. Guys, what are you doing? It's not over yet. We still have a shot. Come back. Let's go back. We will stand by your side. Nothing. They had already made a decision. That was the worst experience in my life. A bitter sense of anguish, remorse, and tragedy that washed over me as I watched Sohumi fall. It was over. Sohumi was lost. And that meant that turning tables regarding the Abkhazian issue would be impossible then. Yeltsin kept silent. The generals would not respond to me. I entered the ruined neighborhoods without them. What should we do, Mr. Shevardnadze? Will it ever end? We have children. Don't worry, we have forces coming in tonight, so... So Humi once again became a target of airstrikes and land and sea attacks. The city found itself blockaded. Gomsakorti returned to Georgia, so he ended up fighting on two fronts. Consequently, his supporters deserted the Abkhazian front. The Joint Chiefs of Staff and all armed forces, including the armed forces under the illegitimate government, must be placed under my command. At that time, the legitimate Abkhazian government was led by Zhuli Shartava. After I saw that the battalions had been discharged and there was essentially no defense, I entered the government building. Shartava called Ilyava, the officer in charge of the Senaki regiment. Please don't give an ultimatum now. It's backstabbing and it's not what real men do. Our common cause is threatened, so come if you're coming and do your job. We'll talk about the rest later. I've spoken and now it's up to you. He refused, saying that he needed President Zviad Gamsakhurdia's orders to act. Unfortunately, national interest took a back seat to partisan or personal sympathies. The plan for the occupation of Suhumi was developed by the Russian Joint Chiefs of Staff. Its chairperson, Kolesnikov, openly spoke about it, even mentioning the date when Suhumi would fall. It was worse than defeat. It was a catastrophe. We were all doomed. Every Georgian who was slaughtered regardless of age and gender. Our regimens and population took two routes to escape. Some were evacuated by sea. 200 refugees were transported to Sochi. Others were evacuated by air. The last plane delivered 120 children, women, and elderly from Dranda to Tbilisi. Most of the refugees, however, fled via the Kadori Gorge. This high mountainous route turned into a true Golgotha for many. Almost 300,000 ethnic Georgians were expelled from one of the most ancient regions of Georgia, simply because they were Georgians. 
It was an outcome of war waged with the participation of Russia's regular army, air, and land forces. It was blatant ethnic cleansing. I failed. I failed to solve the Abkhazian problem. Is it a mistake? It's far greater than a mistake. I failed to solve this problem. Nothing short of a miracle. One surviving airplane turned up with a few liters of fuel left just by chance. The fuel was not enough to make it to Tbilisi, but I was told it could see us through to Batumi. We arrived in Batumi, filled up the tank and flew to Tbilisi. Returning felt much worse than departing, but support from the family and then giving a speech in parliament. What could one do? A person cannot refuse to take responsibility. Most MPs were opposition members. I went to parliament to find everyone on his feet, applauding me. Human nature had awakened in them. They knew what I was going through, and they knew that I needed encouragement and support. After the fall of Sohumi, the situation further intensified in western Georgia. Armed groups favoring the former president, in concert with mercenaries, took over the city of Poti and its port. In doing so, they assumed control over the gateway supplying the country with grain and other food products. It was a dead end. Russia successfully raised Cain, bringing Georgia to the brink of disaster. So I had no choice but to compromise. Georgia had to accept accession to the Commonwealth of Independent States under Russian control. I made a decision about Georgia's accession to the Commonwealth. Today we will hold discussions with the heads of its member states and consider common security in the region. To welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Mr. Edward Sivernatze, President of Georgia. I have given speeches from this platform more than once. I clearly remember my every word since 1985. I believe that one of the reasons all attempts to resolve this conflict have failed is that the UN Security Council, the highest international authority that is obligated by its charter to safeguard global peace, has yet to provide an objective evaluation of what really happened in Abkhazia. Obviously, you cannot fight evil without exposing it for what it is in legal terms. We held a parliamentary election. Along with Parliament, the Georgian people elected me as Speaker of Parliament at first and then as Head of State. Legitimacy was ensured, but a state could not be built without a constitution. The Constitution of Georgia has been adopted. One last step was the signing ceremony of the Constitution, scheduled for August 29th at the Youth Palace. Both my office and the Parliament were housed some 500 meters from the Youth Palace. Covering this distance proved nearly fatal to me. These are lowlifes, terrorists in Georgia, and this is their last attempt. This terrorist attack was unconditionally sanctioned by Jabba Yoseliani, a man who had done everything to ensure my return to Georgia. After the parliamentary election, however, he could not come to terms with the legal restrictions to his authority and the machinery of government. He had succumbed to the corrupting charm of power. It has happened to many before and it usually leads to an unhappy end. To my surprise, the immediate implement of the attack happened to be a distinguished Mehedrioni fighter who had fought courageously in Abkhazia. He was tried and sentenced to prison for this terrorist attack. Later, however, I pardoned him. He even came to see me after my resignation in 2003. That's another feature of Georgian character. Though Jabba and I maintained special relations, one of us had to leave nonetheless. Two years earlier, I had even tried to resign due to serious disagreement with Jabba, 
However, people took to the streets and asked me to stay in office, which I did. I've never said it before, but there have been people in my life, some of them still alive, and some even present here, who are willing to relinquish Sohumi, just to force me to resign. It is true, I knew that. God is my witness, but I could not insult our citizens by admitting that such persons were among us. I spent 12 days there, and all the while I knew, and please forgive me for knowing, it was planned in advance. What can I do now? Should I clutch at straws? I knew it was about to happen, and I was forced to accept the Sochi Treaty. What are you talking about? I'm shaking here. I cannot take it anymore. If a man accepts an office and remuneration, you think you are entitled to treat him like dirt? I refuse to work with such people. This is the last straw. As of today, Shevardnadze has resigned. All of Georgia is anxious. Therefore, I, as Georgia's spiritual father, and personally your spiritual father, have a right to bless you, to assure all of Georgia that you are Georgia's leader. Vode, vo populi. You don't need me to give you a hint. By the way, I know my worth. I don't usually say it, but it's election season, so it's something I can afford. I also know that I'm just as needed today as I was in 1992, because what we started back then must be finalized in the next five years. I, the President of Georgia, solemnly swear before God and the people that I will defend the Constitution and protect the country's independence, unity, and territorial integrity. Let us all work together, selflessly and in concord, to benefit our homeland and people. Let us advance Georgia into the 21st century. Thank you. Everyone knows that I'm used to all kinds of epithets, including the harshest words like traitor or backstabber, not to mention profanities, and someone who is willing to drag the country into a new imperial Russian environment. If someone can do without these ties, let him run the country. I saw no other options. In search of options, I addressed the World Bank, the Council of Europe, and the Monetary Fund, and visited the U.S., Germany, France, China, Turkey, and Iran. I looked for alternative options, but found none except that, at this point, we must restore these ties, and these ties must help Georgia's economy. Today, 
Today, leaders no longer seek to make history. Today, we are workhorses. Speaking of historical figures, the times we are going through today are so important that, and you can take it to the bank, every citizen of Georgia is poised to make history. Because it is today that the fate of a unified and consolidated Georgia is being decided. It is a different world, and if we, the Georgians, act in concord and support one another, if we eradicate bloody feuds from among us, and I can assure you with a clear conscience that we will build a unified, indivisible, and democratic Georgia. I spent that night at the Queen's Palace. I liked it very much. And I wanted to issue some royal decrees, but I was ousted this morning. But I was ousted today. <laughs> Please explain the meaning of the Georgian proverb, I am in need, so with the Queen I am forced to sleep. Well, there was no need nor was the second part of the proverb ever accomplished. <laughs> I would like to welcome all of you and offer you my sincere gratitude for this exceptional reception. <laughs> I have no presents on me, but I can give you my pen. Greetings. You're in excellent shape. You're wonderful for Oh, it's great to have you in our country, in our city. Jim Baker, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Baker, don't come. Well, he actually got me at the... Oh, you saw me. Oh, good. Baker welcomed me, saying that the president is the best golf player. Well, the first thing he told me was the president is best of golf. We played golf oh, Sunday. No. We played golf Sunday. Now, I want to tell his Houston, Houston press something. This is one of the great men of freedom. And during the difficult times, nobody could have been more understanding of the United States and yet standing for his own country with courage and honor. The best. That's why Barbara and I are here. That's why we're here. Every time we, Gela, my friends, and I go visiting, and not to waste what has already been done, I want to give him the floor. <laughs> well, I'll get the credit that he will not lose his job. This 
these busybody reporters. They seek something epic in America. There's nothing heroic about America. Everything seemed to be going well when, out of the blue, another terrorist attack struck. On February 9th, 1998, I left work for home, late as usual. As we approached the obelisk to the 300 Aragvians, I heard a blast, and a grenade hit the front of my armored Mercedes twice. The engine died, and as a result of inertia, the car slid about 100 meters. My bodyguards put up a fight, diverting the terrorists' attention from my sliding automobile. Just one terrorist waiting for our car to come to a stop would be enough to eliminate us. It still tears at my heart that two of my bodyguards fell victim to that terrorist attack. The brakes were acting up and the brake fluid spilled along the road. The Mercedes? Yes, the Mercedes. That's why we spun. I think it's an anomaly. I don't know whether it's good or bad, but I feel no fear. There were moments when I thought I would surely die, but I was not afraid. After I survived two terrorist attacks, the Patriarch gave me a small icon of St. Nicholas, which I always have with me. Solving the immediate problems of the country was not the main goal I sought to achieve by returning to Georgia. Instead, I wanted to impart important global functions to Georgia, which would involve the revitalization of the Silk Road, the issue I advocated in Vladivostok as early as my tenure as foreign minister. After vast oil and natural gas deposits were discovered in the Caspian Sea, I prioritized the Silk Road idea. It was a landmark opportunity for my country, which we could not afford to miss. If Georgia could find its place in this particular international dimension, then it would become vital for many countries, both in the West and in the East. It was not easy to see these projects through. There were many obstacles, and I repeat, both at home and especially abroad. I would like to emphasize the special role of Haydar Aliyev, who has exhibited much determination and courage. He has spared no effort to make sure this pipe comes into effect today. At the initiative of the President of Azerbaijan, transit revenues were refused and handed to Georgia. This is what brotherhood is about. This is what the special relations between our countries are about. All that was accomplished with Russia demanding that Caspian oil and natural gas be transited through only its territory. One of the leaders of the Russian Federation called me in Svaneti the day after the terrorist attack. He congratulated me on surviving and said, please give up talks about oil and gas pipes. Bear in mind, our country takes much interest in this issue. Turkish President Suleyman Demirel and his successor to the office of Prime Minister, Tansu Çiller, made a tremendous contribution to promoting this project and enhancing Georgia-Turkey relations. First, Mr. Demirel, who visited Georgia on numerous occasions, did much for the implementation of this project. The U.S. president was there when we signed the project agreement, and his signature is on the document. This is where the document on the withdrawal of Russian forces and the agreements on the construction of the Baku, Tbilisi, Jehan oil and Trans-Caspian gas pipelines were signed. It was finalized that Haydar Aliyev, Bill Clinton and Suleiman Demirel supported the project and I was one of its initiators. Hey, 
Now I can say that Georgia is in demand. As I kept raving about these pipes, oil transit, and the like, some laughed at me, saying it was just a fantasy. Today it is no longer fantasy. Today Turkey needs us, because the pipeline passes through Georgia, and when the natural gas pipe is in place, Europe will need us too. So I believe that we are 10 to 15 years ahead of our time. Technically, this idea should have been born much later. But after I came to Georgia, I conceived this idea, as I knew well what Georgia was about and what role it could play with the implementation of this project. Cheers to big oil business. Even large countries need Georgia. The sooner Russia realizes Georgia's importance, the better for both them and us. Putin seems so bold at home in Russia. What is he like when you meet him face to face? Is he just as tough and bold? I scare the life out of him. Look what the cat dragged in. You haven't been elected yet. Please rid me of one Abashidza at least. Just keep her, all right? I will resign from the presidency. I'm on my way to her chief. the president for joining his people in song. First of all, when are we going to become members of NATO? I tell you when they leave. I must get this with all the I'm sorry I cannot ask this question in Georgian. Everything in due time. I'm very sorry that I cannot. Thank you for everything you have done to support my country. Hans Dietrich Genscher reminisced about the events of 1992 when I returned home. It was the year when civil war raged in Georgia. He was the first foreigner to visit Georgia while it was burning. And he was the first to lend a helping hand. Hans Dietrich, Georgia will never forget that. Neither this nor future generations. Since that day, we have been through a lot together, but today, Georgia is a state, independent, free, and built upon democratic values. Thank you.
Since I am inviting you to Tbilisi, I want you to know that this is old Tbilisi. Georgia enjoys the status of special guest in the Council of Europe. Yet, however honorable this title may be, overextending a visit is not acceptable to neither the host nor the guest. So I hope that at the 1999 anniversary session, Georgia will emerge as a full member of your large family. Today, the dream of all generations of Georgians has come true. Georgia is a member of the great European family. Thank you, Lord, for making this millennia-old dream of my people come true. On behalf of our delegation and every Georgian citizen, I thank you, Mr. President, the Greek government and people, for your invitation and heartfelt hospitality. I was very excited to learn about having been awarded an Onassis Prize. I thank you with all my heart. I believe that this award belongs to Georgia and my colleagues and opponents alike who have joined me in a struggle for peace in both the Caucasus and the whole world. Your Holiness, Venerable Monastics, I would like to pass to you brotherly greetings from the Catholicos Patriarch of all Georgia, Ilya II. Once again, I thank you for your hospitality and attentiveness. Please consider my visit as a sign of the return to God and orthodoxy on the part of a people fresh out of a totalitarian regime. I don't think any leader of Georgia, or the head or president of any other state for that matter, has been here before me. It is truly an honor. I have to admit, I am a lucky man. Every Georgian dreams of setting foot in this holy mount, of venerating the legacy of our great ancestors. No words can describe my joy at being here. After Georgia gained independence, President Shevardnadze and I sought a place to build the Trinity Cathedral, and we eventually found the spot where today the Holy Trinity Cathedral towers like a king.
You are looking at a cathedral, which means much more to me than just a cathedral. Every morning I open the curtain to check my cathedral. I call it my cathedral. <laughs> I've seen many churches around the world, but to me this one, with its scale, architecture and concept, symbolizes Georgia, new Georgia. I'm convinced that every Georgian, both in this and future generations alike, will rejoice in it. Not much left, not much. Yes, but it still needs work. Yes. I am proud to have contributed to the construction of this cathedral, which was built with the blessing of the Catholicos Patriarch and with donations from Georgian citizens. We established the fund for the construction of the Holy Trinity Cathedral. To launch construction work, I contributed the initial million and a half from the presidential fund. Everyone donated to the fund to the best of his ability, but still it was not enough. Then I turned for help to Bedzina Ivanishvili, a successful Georgian banker. We got along quite well, which is why I decided to turn to him. However, I would never imagine he would assume the lion's share of the expenses. It took nine years to build the cathedral I so cherish. What you are all doing here will make history. Greetings. How are you? You promised to accompany me upstairs, remember? You could not go with me. I remember flying like a teenager up the stairs and beating young men to the top after the dome was installed. The Trinity Cathedral is truly a prayer embodied in stone and marble offered to God by all Georgia. Georgia has always been a crossroads of creeds. For centuries, Georgians were martyred for their Christian faith. Christianity saved Georgians. On one hand, they were martyred, but Christianity saved them on the other. God protected Georgia from annihilation, though small geographically. To me, Georgia is larger than life. We are a witness of globalization around the globe, meaning technological revolution and the spread of modern technology, which no force can stop. Stay out of my way. <laughs> globalization is unstoppable and Georgia must be ready to engage in this process. In our engagement, however, we must preserve our uniqueness, culture and traditions. Everything that appeals not only to the Georgians, but to foreigners as well. First and foremost, I fought to forge a state different from the Soviet Republic it used to be. We built a state, not just I, but also my associates and I, citizens of Georgia and I, together. We built a state, and that's a considerable accomplishment. We spent 200 years under the Russian Empire, and 200 years before that amid trials and tribulations. For the first time in 400 years, the Georgian state was established. Quite an achievement, is it not? For better or worse, I led Georgia out of its lamentable shape. Yet as time went by, people seemed increasingly forgetful of it. I happened to have been the leader of Georgia for quite a while. From 1972 to 2003. Minus the seven years of my tenure as a Soviet foreign minister. During these years, I reconsidered my political views on several occasions. Similarly, 
Stereotypes and public opinion about me as a political figure kept changing. President Shevardnadze has turned into dictator Shevardnadze. The punishment is mine alone, for I have failed to raise you. I always sought and seemed to succeed in finding common grounds with my people. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same about the last period of my government when I sensed a growing distance between a part of society and myself. It was then that I encountered a fierce opposition from those who had gained a foothold in government with my help. The November developments were preceded by a series of events planned with precision by the opposition. I think these events were designed to bring about much more than Shevardnadze's resignation. It seemed to involve a struggle for power in a post-Shevardnadze era. My term of presidency would expire in just 18 months. Early in the morning, November 10th, I, to everyone's surprise, went to face the demonstrators in front of the parliament building. There must have been about a hundred of them, mostly young people. As soon as they saw me, they became agitated and in replying to my greeting, shouted, resign, resign. Dialogue with them proved futile. For the first time in my life, I couldn't speak with people. The word they shouted somehow struck to my memory, like gum to a shoe. I was always there whenever the country was threatened, not looking for trouble, but to stave off trouble. I never backed away fearing dreadful consequences, facing people in dangerous situations and seeking dialogue. This time, however, it was different. The sound of that resign left a bad taste in my mouth like never before. Later, as I was debating resignation, I pictured those young people. That incident had a tremendous impact on my final decision. November 22nd marked the first session of the newly elected parliament. I began my speech. It was quite short, so I took my time. I was not finished with the speech when some commotion distracted me, and then they burst in. My bodyguards grouped around me and led me outside. They were doing their job, unlike those who were obligated to maintain order in the building. They drank my tea. Only later I learned that the demonstrators encountered no resistance as they waltzed into the parliament building. My bodyguards escorted me to the courtyard. We got into a car and left parliament through the left gate, where I met with my supporters from Tbilisi, Ajara, and Kacheti, who were rallying in front of the building. In short, I addressed the people and assessed the incident as an attempted coup. We can solve any problem, including the toughest issues. We have only to observe the law and respect the constitution. We cannot burst into parliament, raising hell and nearly firing shotguns. That's unacceptable. I thought, and I still think, that those days in Georgia's history are over. Apparently, I am mistaken. Those grievous times are not over. Thank you all. I cherish you like my own children, my loved ones. Thank you. Thank you. Then I got into the car and headed toward my residence. They had been plotting an attempted coup for quite some time, I had been informed. They were convinced that Shevardnadze would not use arms against the people. When I declared a state of emergency, I did not mean to use weapons against people. All I wanted to do was put the fear of God into these kids so that they would go home. We must remember that we are but guests in this world, and we cannot sacrifice others' lives just to prove our point. If you claim to be a politician, you should be able to sacrifice yourself for the sake of the people's interests, and only then may you be saved. Late at night, November 23rd, Mikhail Saakashvili and Zurab Zhvania visited me at the official residence in Kertsnisi. About a thousand protesters gathered around the residence. 
Misha and Zura started talking about my resignation, though they were not as persistent and obstinate. My reply was simple. Guys, don't worry. I've already decided to resign, and that's final. You'd better start thinking about tomorrow. I noticed they were at a loss. It's been videotaped. Apparently, they expected me to start bargaining, something along the lines of, let me stay for a while and so on. That's it. It's a done deal. Who will it be, Mr. President? That's not my problem anymore. Where are you going, Mr. President? Home. I breathed a sigh of relief. The confrontation ended without victims and bloodshed. By the time I resigned in 2003, once ruined Tbilisi had already been restored. Georgia's path to European integration had become irreversible. Capital punishment had been abolished. And with US assistance, a strong foundation ensured that the Georgian army would meet NATO standards. Regular army forces were formed, which successfully participated in international programs. The construction of the Baku Tbilisi Chehan pipeline was underway. The revival of the Silk Road was gradually turning from an idea into a reality. The Georgian state assumed international political, economic, and military functions. Georgia had an independent parliament and an independent, reformed judiciary, as well as a free press and a sizable network of NGOs. The country was committed to building a democratic state and civil society. These are my people and this is my country. And if I've done anything valuable in life, it was thanks to their advice, their influence, their solidarity, and their love. They're still part of me, and probably sooner rather than later, we will be together hereafter. I will appear before them with a clean conscience, give due answers to all their questions, and say honestly, I did my best for my country, never shedding the blood of my people, Forgive me whatever I failed to accomplish. Not everything was up to me. Let new generations continue what I started. Love for the people has its roots in love for a particular person. Cherishing the world stems from cherishing one's homeland. And the salvation of mankind starts with your own salvation. This is the creed of a man who miraculously survived three terrorist attacks, a man constantly targeted by all in the final years of his life. A man who was proud of managing without bloodshed events impacting people's lives, even if it came at the expense of compromising his personal authority and office. A man who, thanks to it all, considers himself a victor, not a loser. That's all I have to say. My life and my time, with its positive and negative aspects, are unveiled for you to see. I have laid out everything I believe to be of interest to you. 
Feel free to judge me severely. No quarter asked. However, I myself am the toughest judge of my life and deeds. I know I have erred and have been unfair to some. I have hurt many, and I pray they can find it in their hearts to forgive me. I have forgotten every mistreatment, and I carry no grudge. I have never been envious, simply because I could achieve my goals on my own. I have always tried to make full use of my God-given talent and skills, to do what I could and what I was called to do. Love and peace fill my heart, and I wish the same to my people and my children. I am not afraid of dying. Whatever must happen, will happen. But the soul is eternal. It never dies.